right, should we get started? <clears throat> so, um, what I'd like to talk about uh, in uh, my three lectures is uh, really a broad brush introduction to um, two important aspects of LHE physics. First of all, uh, the theoretical motivations for expecting new physics or not, <laughs> um, and uh, what the big questions uh, are that are stake, uh, are that are at stake, um, uh, which some of which we heard uh, wonderfully reviewed by uh, Nati in the last lecture. I'll put a little bit more flesh on uh, some of those bones and talk about them in a little more detail on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, there's some very basic things about the LHC itself, about collider physics, and about how to uh, uh, think about um, the actual collisions that are happening at this magnificent machine. And uh, the reason I'm splitting the lectures, and actually I'll be going back and forth between them in this way, is partially to emphasize that in this era, that's how you need to think if you're going to actually make some contributions. Uh, it's a really interesting time that's, that needs this uh, melange of theoretical thinking on the one hand, as well as some nitty gritty understanding of what's actually going on uh, with the collider. And if we're lucky and there is something to actually see, this is going to be stupendous fun. It's going to be incredible to uh, combine these two different styles of thinking. It's a sort of combination that theoretical physics hasn't had to do for 30 or 40 years. Um, and uh, in the last great era of discovery that uh, culminated with the invention of the standard model, it was exactly these theorists. It was the theorists uh, were not always the most uh, formal sophisticated, although they knew about the deep underlying theoretical ideas, uh, nor were they nose to the grindstone just constantly in the details of the experiment, but people who were somehow splitting the difference between them who managed to figure out what was going on. And so it's important to realize physics is a totally unified subject. We can go back and forth between uh, all of these things. And so uh, uh, that's what I want to talk about. So I'm going to uh, uh, really talk about um, both the theoretical motivations as well as the uh, as well as just some of the basic mechanics of um, collider physics. And all these themes will be further explored in more detail by uh, some of the subsequent lectures. So let me start um, with uh, some of the uh, theoretical um, underpinnings of uh, everything that we're going to be discussing. And really, the discovery of the Higgs is uh, really a watershed uh, moment in the history of our subject. Um, and as I will uh, uh, say in a little bit more detail, um, the discovery of the Higgs is really the completion of the last part of this fantastic architecture of physics that were handed in the 20th century. Um, it used to be, it's a, it's a famous, wonderful saying, that string theory was a bit of 21st century physics that fell by accident into the 20th century. Well, the discovery of the Higgs is a bit of 20th century physics that fell by accident into the 21st. <laughs> um, by all rights, the Higgs should have been discovered in Waxahachie, Texas in 1999, and, uh, and it wasn't. Uh, but it, it belongs to the 20th century. The ideas uh, involved are, uh, is, it's the last piece of, of this magnificent architecture of 20th century physics. And this would be a whole other lecture series in itself to, to really uh, substantiate the point I'm, I'm about to make in, in, his, uh, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a variety of ways. But um, the big lesson of the 20th century is that uh, uh, the combination of these two big revolutions of relativity and quantum mechanics turn out to be incredibly constraining. Uh, vastly more constraining than either one by themselves. Uh, and it's really relativity and quantum mechanics that for the first time uh, allow us to reduce our uncertainty about nature down to very, very few small, discrete moving parts. Uh, largely speaking, the union of relativity and quantum mechanics into quantum field theory makes most of the gross properties of the long distance universe, uh, sufficiently long distance universe, completely inevitable, following just almost immediately from these basic, from these basic principles. There's hardly any choices in the way the world works. Uh, the only choices we have is a sort of small menu of particles drawn from a small number of spins, and 
uh, we can choose their interaction strengths, but that's it. You know, before, before uh, relativity and quantum mechanics, we could imagine a continuous infinity of different possible universes. After uh, discovering both of these principles, we have a shockingly restricted picture of the way the world works. Uh, and uh, that means that today we're in a rather different situation than we were in even 50 years ago. 50 years ago, people still didn't understand that, uh, that quantum field theory was so tremendously restrictive, or they still thought that there may be other there may be other ways of running things that weren't described in that language. Uh, and so when all these surprising discoveries started happening, with the strong interactions and so on, um, uh, people cast about for what appeared to be very different ideas than uh, quantum field theory that might describe what was going on. Uh, of course, it all ended up, in the end, uh, it ended up being the case that quantum field theory is vastly richer than anyone realized could imagine and ended up explaining all these things that we saw. That's a completely remarkable fact that was not obvious at all. The answer wasn't to overthrow quantum field theory, but rather to be much more conservative and understand what it could do more and more deeply. And so w w we have so much faith in it now, and we understand so much that this structure follows inevitably just from the basic principles of relativity and quantum mechanics, that today it is not the case that if we turn on you know, in 2015, we start discovering some new physics at the LHC. Everyone is going to interpret it within the basic framework of quantum field theory. That's something we understand now. That's, it's, 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 it would be completely shocking if uh, something took us outside that, that basic framework. Um, and that's a, that's a big difference. So we have a much stronger theoretical foundation on which to build and understand uh, the way the world works. And in fact, in a sense, because of that, our questions have moved away from trying to uh, talk so much about the mechanics of how particles interact and so on. That we understand. Once we have the menu of particles and the interaction strengths, we understand that mechanics. We understand the, the, the basic formalism of quantum field theory. We know how to go about doing that. The questions have gone up a level in trying to understand why we got handed this extremely strange particular quantum field theory that we seem to have with... Uh, a number of its tantamount uh, confusions. So that's what I want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about. And at least one aspect of the problem, uh, one aspect of the question can be thought of as the continuing march towards finding a sensible theory of all interactions to exponentially shorter distances or higher energies than we're at. So this has been, this has been a, a guiding theme over the past 50 years. And, um, and in a sense, with the discovery of the Higgs, we finally have it. With the discovery of the Higgs, finally for the first time, we have in our hands uh, a theory that describes everything we know about nature that in principle makes sense to exponentially higher energies than we have been. Um, and just to remind you why that's for the first time, uh, if we go back 50 years ago, well, if all you knew about was QED, then when people figured out how QED worked, great, you had a theory that made sense of electrons and photons to exponentially higher energies. And there's a Landau pulse somewhere, but you could go to exponentially higher energies than any energy that uh, anyone had been to. But right as QED was getting settled, there were these confusions. There was the strong interactions that, that people knew the proton couldn't be elementary. People knew just from, from the fact, for example, that its uh, G factor was not equal to two, that the proton had a size. It couldn't be elementary. It was strongly interacting. So right there, there was some new physics that had to take place at the scale of the size of the proton, which was one over a GeV. And people also knew about the weak interactions. And the weak interactions are associated with even uh, higher energy scales. The only reason people managed to notice the weak interactions is that the weak interactions violated uh, what would otherwise be a symmetry of just QED with, let's say, electrons and muons. Okay. Uh, if there was no weak interactions, muon number and electron number would be separately conserved, but, uh, but there's this tiny process that makes muons decay. And so this was 
suppressed by 1 over 100 GV squared, roughly speaking, or the, the uh, Fermi constant. So already, even though we had QED and it by itself could make sense exponentially higher energies, we knew about the presence of these other uh, high energy scales that we had to deal with. Eventually, just with the strong interactions, people figured out that that could, in all of this could arise from QCD. And QCD not only makes sense of exponentially higher energies, but is even asymptotically free. So all by itself, it could be extrapolated to arbitrarily high energies, if that's all there was. So that left us with the weak interactions. And with the weak interactions, as you know, there was a two-step process. First, people realized that you could generate uh, that for Fermi interaction, if you imagined that there was underlying W particles, and then Glashar realized there had to be a Z as well, but anyway, let's just talk about the uh, W. Okay. And then it looks like, okay, everything is great. Now we have a theory involving the interactions of electrons, neutrinos, and Ws. And this theory, like every other uh, uh, consistent theory we have of, of interactions of uh, uh, spin one particles with spin a half particles and so on, this is going to make sense to very high energies, just like QED. Uh, but there was a fly in the ointment that I think Scott Thomas will talk about more in his lectures uh, that you, uh, many of you are probably familiar with. <coughs> there is a discrete difference. There's a discrete difference between the spin one particles that make an appearance here and the spin one particles we're familiar with, like the photon in QED, this, the W is massive, and uh, that means that there's a discontinuous difference between the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, the, the, the massive spin one particle has three degrees of freedom. A massless spin one particle has two degrees of freedom. And while it's guaranteed on general grounds that the interactions of the transverse components of the W at high energies are guaranteed to be okay and everything is fine, there is one extra degree of freedom, the longitudinal degree of freedom. And if you have just nothing else, you just take what we've seen, you blow the four Fermi coupling up into that. After all, today we know the W is, is known for a long time that it is, exists anyway. But this is only a partial UV completion of the four Fermi vertex, because now the Ws themselves, the scattering of the longitudinal components of the Ws themselves, grows with energy. That extra degree of freedom is not harmless. For good reasons, the amplitude grows with energy, and this amplitude actually grows like g squared, energy squared over mw squared. And so despite all of this hard work of introducing the w, all you manage to do is lift up the scale up to which the theory could make sense by a factor of 10 or so, okay? Because uh, that scattering amplitude becomes strongly coupled at around 1.2 TeV, okay? So you have this four Fermi operator suppressed by 100 GeV, and after all this gymnastics, now you have a new theory that breaks down <laughs> at 1.2 TeV, okay? So this continual, the, the strong interactions took care of themselves, this would be wonderful, QCD makes sense up to arbitrarily high energies, but the weak interactions, you keep going and you keep hitting a brick wall not far away from where we are, okay? The truly remarkable thing, I mean, we've seen this kind of situation many other places in physics, many other places where you have some low energy theory with amplitudes that are growing as a power law as you go to high energies, and then something dramatically different happens at high energies. Those degrees of freedom melt into completely new objects at very high energies. This dimensional analysis is identical, just as dimensional analysis goes to the problem of quantum gravity. There too, the amplitudes grow quadratically with energy, and something dramatically new is supposed to happen at the Planck scale. Uh, in many other places in physics, this kind of situation arose, and, and, and very different kinds of physics was involved. The incredible thing is that what nature has chosen to do instead is something far, far simpler, and which we've never seen before, at least in a state of nature. Uh, the addition of a single spin zero particle, one measly spin zero particle is all it takes to solve this problem. <laughs> solve this problem and finally give us a theory for the first time that we have under our feet that makes sense to exponentially higher energies, okay? So, so the discovery of the Higgs is, uh, is a sort of triumph of this kind of thinking. It's a triumph of weak coupling 
uh, as Nazi also emphasized, uh, we had indications already in the late 1980s and early 90s that electroweak symmetry breaking would be weakly coupled. Um, that was already a very powerful hint that something like uh, the Higgs had to be discovered. And uh, the confirmation of that hint directly, uh, the, the confirmation of a hint by discovering the Higgs more or less where we expected it to be from precision electroweak grounds, it's a very powerful indication that uh, that we know what we're doing and at least describing the mechanics of, of the world around us. Okay, so uh, we have this theory that makes sense to exponentially higher energies. So what does it look like at exponentially higher energies, okay? We can, we can extrapolate the couplings, we can run the renormalization group, we can just see what does a standard model look like as we go to much, much higher energies. Of course we know, we'll come back to it in a moment, but somewhere near the Planck scale, all hell is breaking loose because of uh, quantum mechanics and gravity, that's uh, incredibly far away. Uh, what does everything else look like? The answer is, it doesn't look particularly remarkable. Let me just give you a little snapshot of what the coupling constants of the standard model look like as we run them to higher energies. So these are the large dimensionless coupling constants. The big dimensionless coupling constants in the standard model are the three gauge interactions and the top Yukawa coupling, okay? Those are the big couplings. The top Yukawa coupling at low energies is actually, is around one. Uh, then we have, uh, uh, we have uh, G3 is up here somewhere. So here's G3 is, so here's energy, here's 100 GeV, okay? Uh, so this is G3. Um, G2 is, gets a little stronger as we go to uh, shorter distances, not asymptotically free. G1 gets a little stronger, okay? Nothing is looking particularly, uh, it's not going all the way up to one, okay? Everything looks kind of normal. You see the famous near coincidence of the running of the couplings, okay? In, in the standard model, G3, G2, and G1 start off, you know, maybe uh, alpha 3, alpha 2, and alpha 1 differ by maybe a factor of 10 or 20 at low energies, but they roughly converge as you go to high energies. That's the rough qualitative idea of unification, although it doesn't, uh, it doesn't work uh, particularly accurately quantitatively. Uh, and here's the top Yukawa coupling. And the top Yukawa coupling is going down. Okay, so that's, uh, that's roughly what it looks like. No, nothing particularly surprising. Everything is running lo logarithmically. And uh, so, um, uh, so, so that's it. Now actually, there is one quantity here which uh, is uh, important, uh, important to the consistency of the whole picture, of course, which is the higgs quartic coupling. Remember, the higgs quartic coupling sets uh, the mass of the physical Higgs, or more properly, the ratio of the mass of the Higgs to the W mass uh, is set by the ratio of lambda over G squared, okay? So if lambda's the quartic coupling, uh, and lambda around, uh, the, the lambda that corresponds to a mass around 125 GeV is, I don't know, 0.2 or something like that, okay? So here's what lambda does as we go to higher energies, and here's zero, here's 0.2, Okay, this is maybe somewhat interesting. As you go to higher energies, lambda gets smaller and smaller. Actually, somewhere across a zero, somewhere around, I forget where it is exactly, maybe around 10 to the 10 GeV, lambda crosses zero. And it stays relatively small over a large range of energies where it's, uh, uh, and it becomes negative, okay? All right, now, uh, First of all, before talking about uh, this aspect, uh, one important part of this entire picture is that in order to be able to extrapolate the physics to very high energies, it was important that lambda is small, okay? Uh, in fact, you all probably know that uh, if you just had a phi to the four theory and nothing else, then the self-coupling of the, uh, the, the quartic coupling gets bigger as you scale to higher energies, okay? And so that, that should tell you that if the quartic coupling is big enough, all the other couplings are going to be irrelevant. It's just gonna drive itself bigger and bigger and bigger, okay? And somewhere it has a Landau pull. So that limits the uh, energy scale up to which you can extrapolate the theory. 
having the Higgs all by itself was not a panacea, that all of a sudden the theory makes sense exponentially higher energies, it makes sense exponentially higher energies to the extent that the quartic coupling is small. And it's really a quantitative point. The Higgs has got to be lighter than something in order for the theory to be sensible to very high energies. If the Higgs was 500 GeV, the theory would break down right above our heads. And having the Higgs or not having the Higgs would not make so big a difference as far as the march to shorter distances was, was concerned, right? It's really the fact that the Higgs is so light that makes the quartic coupling so small uh, that allows things, it allows it not to destroy itself and really give us a picture that makes sense of very, very high energies. But in fact, it's a little more interesting than that because you can see that not only is it small and it stays small, it gets smaller. It doesn't get bigger like you would naively expect from a uh, five to the four interaction. And of course, there's, there's no mystery here. Uh, if we look at uh, the different ingredients that contribute to the renormalization group equation for lambda, let's just draw the various diagrams that can generate a quartic coupling for us, okay? Well, there's the sort of, there's the familiar one for just phi to the fourth theory, which would just look like that. So this gives us in the beta function, and I won't write down any of the factors, but it gives us uh, for the beta function something that goes like plus lambda squared. That's the familiar thing that makes it want to blow up as you go to high energies. But the most important correction actually comes from a loop of the top quark. And you see, this, is, uh, this gives you a contribution to the quartic coupling that goes like uh, lambda top to the fourth, okay? Sorry, this was lambda top. And it's a fermion, so it comes in with a minus sign, okay? So uh, I, I want you to notice something. Uh, the Higgs coupling is the first coupling that we've seen uh, which is not just multiplicatively renormalized under the renormalization group, okay? It gets uh, contributions that have nothing to do with itself. In fact, there is a piece that has to do with the top Yukawa coupling. Okay, we have analogous pieces where we have gauge bosons running in the loop. Okay, so this would go like, for example, G2, square, G2 to the fourth or G1 to the fourth, but they're bosons, so it's the opposite sign. So let's, let me just call it a g to the fourth. Finally, we have other pieces too, which for example, have a loop of the top quark as just uh, wave function renormalization. This is again multiplicative though, okay? So, and that turns out to be a piece that's like plus lambda top squared lambda and the an analog from the gauge field is a minus g squared lambda, okay? So these are the various, uh, these are the various contributions. Uh, I'm not putting any of the factors in 16 pi squares, but I'll put a three there because there's three colors, <laughs> okay? Just to emphasize that it's something which is uh, even more important. And anyway, so there it is. You see it's the largeness of the top Yukawa coupling which uh, pushes the quartic coupling down as you go to higher energies, okay? And in fact, at some scale, it goes negative. All right. Now some people are excited about the fact that the Higgs quartic is uh, going negative. Uh, and by the way, of course, this is all assuming we're, we're just doing a theoretical exercise of extrapolating the standard model to very high energies just to see what it looks like, okay? If we just take the standard model with the measured value of the Higgs mass that now tells us what the quartic coupling is, we extrapolate to very high energies. It's a fairly unremarkable picture for the coupling constants. There's this near miss for unification perhaps, uh, maybe, the thing worth commenting on or exploring a little more is the fact that the quartic coupling goes negative. Okay. Now, the fact that the quartic coupling goes negative means that our vacuum uh, is metastable, okay? And that we can actually decay, okay? Um, now, let me talk about the physics of this decay a, a little bit, okay? Um, let me make life uh, a little simpler, and let's actually ignore the fact that there's a sort of subtle effect that the quartic coupling starts positive, it runs negative, okay? Let's do something even simpler, just uh, as we'll see, it's basically exactly the same. Let's just imagine that we had, forget the standard model, let's imagine that we have a minus phi to the fourth theory. So the potential is minus lambda phi to the fourth. 
okay? Really terrible, right? And let's say that we say that the universe lives around phi equals zero. The expectation value is phi close to zero, okay? All right. So, does that make sense? What do you think happens there? What do you think happens? That, wh what's your first instinct? My first instinct is this thing is going to run away like hell, nothing, right? That's, uh, and by the way, you can b bolster that instinct by thinking, what if it was minus m squared phi squared? Not minus phi to the fourth. What is minus m squared phi squared? Then, well, duh. I mean, on, 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 on some time scale, you're immediately going to, to go out. Um, and how long is it going to take you to traverse in field space uh, a phi of order m while the only scale in town is m? So on the time scale given by m, you're unstable. It's horrendously unstable, okay? Or let's say we had a phi cube theory, okay? Well, mu phi cubed, mu is also dimensionful. The instability time scale is set by mu, okay? So it's immediate, it's rapid, it's just given by the scale in the problem. Well, but if you apply that logic here, you see, you already have, have a problem. You, you, in your gut, you might think that this is going to just go right away. But what would set the scale? Lambda is dimensionless. Okay, so. And in fact, uh, if you think a little more formally, you say, well, I can do perturbation theory. No order of perturbation theory, do I see any vacuum instability, right? So, your, your reaction might also be, well, perturbation theory sucks, we need much more non-perturbative things, and so on, but perturbation theory is very, very smart. And, uh, and so you should always pay attention to what it has to say. And when you don't see an effect in perturbation theory, it's telling you that the effect is non-perturbative, <laughs> okay? It's telling you that the instability, in this case, the time scale for getting out is exponentially small in lambda. It goes like e to the minus one over the magnitude of lambda. In fact, it's a tunneling process, despite the fact that in that picture it doesn't look like a tunneling process, okay? Now let's try to understand why it's a tunneling process. Well, let's start by, let's start by actually, uh, let, let me remind you of the biggest difference. See, whenever, biggest difference between quantum field theory and quantum mechanics, okay? The biggest difference between quantum field theory and quantum mechanics, if this was a, if this was a, uh, one particle potential in quantum mechanics, you can bet it would be instantly unstable, <laughs> okay? But the difference between quantum field theory and quantum mechanics is gradients, okay? That we don't just have a bunch of independent uh, uh, quantum mechanical particles at different points in space. They're coupled to each other. There's gradient energy, so you can't fluctuate here. Uh, you, you can't have large fluctuations, spatial fluctuations cost. They cost gradient energy. So if we go and we think what would be the picture that would correspond to the naive thought that you're rolling off, that would mean that you start with phi equals zero and then everywhere in the universe, at the same time, the field fluctuates to the same spot, right? That's ridiculously unlikely, right? In order for it to have the same fluctuation uh, everywhere by the same amount is something that's exponentially suppressed in the volume of the universe, okay? So that can't happen. That cannot happen. In fact, what can happen is that we can have a quantum fluctuation, let's say, in a little bubble that has a size r, right? So we can, we can imagine localized quantum mechanical fluctuations, saying in that bubble, the field fluctuates away from phi to some value phi naught. So I'm just being qualitative here, but just to give you a feeling that this is really a tunneling process, and it's because of gradient energy that it's a tunneling process, okay? Okay, well, let's ask energetically, what would phi naught and r have to be in order for this bubble to actually then want to grow and, uh, and take over the universe? Well, just to make this bubble and have it have zero energy, there's a competition. On the one hand, there's a piece of the energy that you're winning by the fact that the potential is lower there. So that's the energy density times r cubed. But there's a piece that you're losing. And um, what you're losing is the gradient energy, okay? The gradient energy goes like phi naught squared over r squared, roughly speaking. That's the gradient is phi naught over r, so it's grad phi squared, integrated over that volume, r cubed. So to, to make this bubble, we have to have a fluctuation phi naught in that bubble 
such that this is equal to zero. And if I just solve that for the combination phi naught squared r squared, you see that phi naught squared r squared has got to be one over lambda. So this is starting to make sense. If lambda is small, you need a big fluctuation in phi naught in order to be able to make a, a, a zero energy bubble that then has, uh, has, has a chance. This, that's why it's a tunneling process to make this bubble. In fact, we can estimate what is the amplitude? What is the amplitude to make a fluctuation in phi naught of that size? And this is something that you normally, in courses, don't spend a long time thinking about, talking about, but of course, Quantum field theory is just a special case of good old-fashioned quantum mechanics. So there is a ground state wave function, right? There's a ground state wave function for phi. For any configuration for phi, there's some amplitude to find it in that configuration. And all we need to remember is that if, if we're ignoring interactions, and here, here we're just looking at, uh, here we're just looking at, you know, we're treating lambda as a perturbation, so at zeroth order, phi is just free. Uh, this ground state wave function is Gaussian. So what is the amplitude for finding that configuration? If I take the ground state wave function for phi and I ask what is the amplitude that I find it in this configuration, well, this is just e to the minus phi naught squared r squared. Okay. Just on general grounds. And so we see that that's indeed exponentially small. Okay. By the way, when we say that, uh, uh, when we do dimensional analysis and we talk about the fact that the scalar field has dimension d minus two over two in d dimensions, for example, right? Normally this is just, you know, something we do, it just seems like a trivial bit of engineering uh, dimensional analysis when we stare at the action. Uh, but there is a more physical meaning to it, okay? Uh, which is of course very closely related. It's the fact that the typical size of the quantum fluctuation for phi in four dimensions is of order one over r. In six dimensions, it's of order one over r squared. Eight dimensions of order one over r cubed and so on. The typical size of the fluctuation for phi is, goes down as a big power of r, okay? Uh, and that's true for dimensions that are greater than or, or equal to three the fluctuation gets smaller as you go to larger and larger distances. That's an effect of the gradient energy, and as you would expect, as you go to higher and higher dimensions, there's more and more things surrounding a given point. Gradients are more and more important, and fluctuations are more and more suppressed. That's the, that's the uh, physical, uh, a slightly more physical way of, of, of describing what that engineering dimension of the field means. It's, it's telling you how important gradients are and how much they suppress the fluctuations of the scalar on large scales. Of course, d equals two is very special because everything is logarithms in two dimensions. And d equals one is going back to quantum mechanics and there the picture is exactly the opposite, right? That's why if you just talk about a free particle in a box, the wave function is exactly the op opposite way around. It's totally delocalized in the whole box, right? It's the small size of these fluctuations is what allows us to even talk about the vacuum expectation value of a scalar field. Okay, it's because the size of the fluctuations it gets smaller and smaller at larger and larger scales. Anyway, that's just a, a little aside. But, so we see that, in fact, it's not a disaster if the quartic coupling goes negative, it's a quantitative question. It's a quantitative question. Of course, a vacuum is unstable, but it's a quantitative question what the scale of instability is. If it's fast or slow compared to the age of the universe. Now, if we, just push this a little bit more. Um, in this approximation, so uh, let's say I want to calculate some decay rate. A decay rate is a decay rate per unit volume because this is a process that can take place everywhere in space, okay? So there's some decay rate per unit volume which is, should have units of mass to the fourth, okay? So what could it be? The decay rate per unit volume is gonna go like, well, the only thing that's setting the scale is the size of the bubble and then I get e to the minus one over the magnitude of lambda. Let's say lambda is, is negative, okay? Again, I'm being uh, qualitative for the moment. Now, here we have a problem, again, because 
the lambda phi to the fourth theory is classically scale invariant. And so actually we get contributions from all bubbles of all scales, and they all seem to contribute equally. Of course, that's false because lambda is itself running. Lambda is itself a running coupling. So a better estimate for the decay rate, a better estimate, in fact, the one loop correct estimate for the decay rate is something like an integral over bubbles, dr over r, one over r to the fourth, and now I'll be correct with the factors, which you can actually get very simply from this uh, bubble picture if you just work it out. Eight pi squared over three, the running value of lambda at the scale one over r. Okay? So that's a better uh, approximation. And now actually this is dominated somewhere. This turns out to be dominated at around the bubble for which lambda runs as slowly as possible. So lambda goes negative, but there is some regime where the beta function for lambda is small, and in that neighborhood you're just adding up everything, okay? So a, a decent approximation to this is one over r star to the fourth e to the minus eight pi squared over three lambda at one over r star, where this r star is a place where beta lambda goes to zero. It's just a rough approximation to this guy. All right, so now, now we have, uh, now we have uh, a measure. So, uh, uh, so if we have the standard model and nothing else, this is one perhaps amusing feature, that the Higgs quarter coupling runs negative as we go to high energies. It's interesting that it runs negative and it stays relatively small uh, for that uh, whole range. And now we can ask the question, what is that lifetime, okay? Now, of course, as many of you know, before the Higgs was discovered, people did this kind of analysis and they actually discovered that if the Higgs was at 115 GeV, not 125, but 115, which makes it a little lighter, makes the quarter coupling even a little smaller, that means the quarter coupling a little smaller, it goes negative faster, it gets a little more negative as you run to higher energies, so the instability rate is faster. And they discovered at around 115 GeV, the lifetime you get from this process is comparable to the age of the universe. <laughs> okay. So had we discovered the Higgs at around 115 GeV, and you assumed it was a standard model and nothing else, then it's party time because it's about, everything is about to go to hell at any moment, right? <laughs> right. Um, as it turns out, it's 125 GeV, which is still light enough that it, if you just do this extrapolation, it goes negative, but the lifetime is exponentially, you see there's this exponential sensitivity, so it's exponentially uh, longer than anything that uh, we care about. Okay, now, so, so that's one interesting feature of the, uh, detailed feature of the extrapolation that we have to high energies. There are some people who are excited about the fact that it seems that lambda is close to zero if you extrapolate the high scales. There are papers saying maybe there's some kind of criticality of the standard model or, or something like that. Um, and, you know, it is some uh, uh, amusing conspiracy between the value of the top Yukawa coupling, alpha strong, the strong coupling, and the Higgs mass, that that becomes, that that becomes the case. I'm personally not very impressed by this. Um, the reason is that what's really going on is just that the Higgs quartic coupling gets small somewhere. Okay? If lambda is small somewhere, uh, then the fact that it further stays small is a consequence of what you see roughly in that picture, that all the couplings are getting smaller as we scale to high energies. They enter the beta function as fourth powers there, so everything is slowing down a lot. So, all it takes is that lambda is small somewhere, and if it's small somewhere, then it'll stay relatively close to zero as you scale to high energies. In other words, if you measure the relevant sizes of the beta functions in their natural units, not units in this case, but compared to their typical size you'd expect given uh, those uh, fourth powers and, and the values of the top Yukawa coupling and G and so on, th uh, the fact that the coupling stay small as you go to high energies is no more than a 30 or 40 percent accident, okay? So I'm personally not very excited by this, but, uh, but there are people who find it more, more compelling. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's, um, uh, that's the summary of where we are today with all the interactions other than gravity. As I said, uh, it's this uh, 
triumph of quantum field theory that everything makes sense, and for the first time in our history, we have a theory that can be self-consistently extrapolated to exponentially higher energies. Okay. So now let's turn to the problems. And Nati talked about some of these. Um, but, oh, actually, perhaps uh, before getting uh, to the problems, uh, let me say something else. So this is the structure that we have that can be self-consistently extrapolated to very high energies. What do we know about physics at much, much higher energies, okay? Um, of course, we're probing the TeV scale with the LHC, but for much longer than that, we have been probing high energy physics uh, through indirect effects. Um, and, you know, that, that there, are, there are two ways of probing two, there are three ways in principle of probing high energy physics, okay? Um, Number one, go there, best possible way, <laughs> okay? So you wanna know what's going on at the 1,000 TeV? You know, to make yourself some alien friends who are much more advanced than us and have them, you know, hand you your uh, private accelerator and go to 1,000 TeV. Best possible way is to go to higher energies. If you can't go to higher energies, there's a, uh, there's a dumber thing that you can do, uh, which is to say, well, we know that whatever the physics is at much higher energies, at low energies, it's guaranteed to be described by some effective field theory. The dominant parameters are the dimensionless couplings, um, but there may be higher dimension operators suppressed by powers of that high energy scale, and that means that their presence in principle is reflected in the fact that every single process that we talk about has some power law corrections that go like energy squared over some high scale squared, or energy to the fourth over some high scale to the fourth, and so on. So you could say, maybe I can look for the presence of those uh, uh, high energy effects by doing extremely precise measurements of low energy processes to find those deviations that go like powers of low energy, uh, low energies divided by the high scale. And that is typically a very dumb strategy if you do it for garden variety processes because you're fighting against something which is present already. <laughs> okay. The one time where, there's, uh, where it, it makes sense is if you happen to be looking at processes where for an accidental reason, the low energy physics that you have gives zero. So the leading thing that you're looking for is coming from, uh, from uh, from higher energies. After all, we had an example of that already with the weak interactions, right? That's just what we said. The weak interactions were discovered, the 100 GeV scale was discovered by these people in the 1930s because it violated the symmetry of QED, okay? So it gave you a process that was otherwise forbidden. Um, so uh, we can do exactly the same thing today, and as many of you know, we've been doing this for a long time. The standard model, if we just imagine it's an effective theory up to some scale lambda uv, then uh, as a complete accident, there are accidental symmetries of dimensionless couplings These accidental symmetries are baryon number, lepton number, and uh, we have actually a whole host of others. Uh, we have, if we imagine, many of the Yukawa couplings are small, right? If we imagine turning off all the Yukawa couplings, then the standard model would have a huge, bigger flavor symmetry. We could take every generation for Q, U, D, L, and E, and we could rotate every one of them by a U3. Okay, so we'd have five copies of U3, that's a big accidental symmetry. Of course, the Yukawa couplings break those accidental symmetries, but they break them in a very particular pattern. So, uh, so we have an accidental symmetry, which is this U3 to the fifth, broken only by lambda U, lambda D, and uh, lambda E. And associated with that, we have this very controlled source of CP violation. Okay, so there's all these opportunities to look for, uh, all these opportunities to look for 
uh, higher scale physics by looking at things that violate baryon or lepton number, violate flavor in a way that's different than the pattern that's uh, forced on us in the standard model by the pattern of Yukawa couplings, new source of CP violation, and so on. So people have known this since time immemorial, and so they've been looking since time immemorial. And of course, nothing has been seen. So we have limits on the scale of higher dimension operators. I'll just give some samples. So we have dimension six operators, for example, like quark, 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 lepton over some high scale m squared, okay? That violates baryon and lepton number, gives proton decay, and uh, this scale m has got to be in excess of about 10 to the 16 GeV or so. Okay. So that's very dramatic. Okay. Um, that means whatever physics we have right above us, if there's anything, uh, has to respect baryon and lepton number to incredibly good accuracy. Okay. Um, <coughs> there are some dimension five operators. The most famous one is the one that gives you neutrino masses involving uh, L, uh, the leptons, and the Higgs. Okay? Again, this M has got to be bigger depending on exactly what you put there, maybe around 10 to the 14 GeV or so, in order not to make neutrino masses that are too large. Of course, we've seen neutrino masses, so perhaps we've seen this operator. Perhaps we've seen this dimension five operator. But we don't know for a fact that we've seen this dimension five operator because we don't know whether the neutrino masses that we've seen actually violate lepton number. This violates lepton number. So you rotate L, this, uh, uh, you rephase L, that isn't invariant. But it could be that the neutrino masses that we've observed are Dirac and they don't violate lepton number. So that's why we don't actually know whether we've seen this dimension five operator or not. Um, perhaps we have, but, uh, uh, but at any rate, it can't be suppressed by a low scale again, otherwise neutrino masses would be way too big, okay? All right, then actually we have a whole host of less dramatic, but still very important things. Uh, we have typical violations of flavor, okay? So here's an example of an operator. There's strange and a down quark, okay? An SD conjugate squared. Um, this has got to be suppressed by around 1,000 TeV. This dimensional six operator is going to be suppressed by 1,000 TeV squared. Otherwise, we'd get huge contributions to KK bar mixing. Again, why? It's because in the standard model, you can't just have a strange and a down. You have to have them in combinations involving all the Yukawa couplings. Uh, because of that very special pattern for the way the flavor symmetries are broken, so the coefficients come out very small, okay? So you can't just uh, have them sitting there willy-nilly. Uh, other dimension six operators are, for example, L, H, E conjugate, okay? So that's what would normally look like a, what would normally look like <coughs> the Yukawa coupling for the electron, for example but let me stick a sigma mu nu f mu nu in here. Uh, <coughs> and if this coefficient has a phase, um, this gives rise to uh, electric dipole moments of the electron uh, that would be too big unless the scale is around 30 TeV squared. And that's even putting in the electron Yukawa coupling See, it's only fair to put in the electron Yukawa coupling here because something is suppressing this coupling without the F mu nu. Something's making the electron mass small. But even if you put that small Yukawa coupling in, you would get a electric dipole moment for the electron that's vastly too big unless that scale is suppressed by uh, 30 TeV or more. Okay, so on the one hand, the theoretical structure makes sense extrapolated to exponentially high energies. We're looking at the LHC. We haven't seen any new physics yet. And furthermore, way before the LHC, for 30 years, we've been looking for hints of indirect hints of new physics. And so far, we haven't seen anything. And if we just look at the scales involved, the scales are, at least on the face of it, are vastly larger 
than the DEV scale. All right, so that's the, <coughs> that's the present state of affairs. Uh, any questions about that? All right, so now let's move on to uh, recapitulating what some of the problems are. Why, despite this state of affairs, there is something to work on, okay? Okay. So despite these wonderful successes, I think in fundamental physics today, really broadly speaking, we have two very big problems, which may be related to each other. Uh, the first problem is, in a sense, the deepest one because it goes to the very heart of the foundations that have been so spectacularly successful, okay? We've, we've been handed, uh, quantum mechanics and relativity and really more, more specifically the idea of a space-time with local interactions in it. Um, so space-time and quantum mechanics together give us this fantastic structure that works so wonderfully. Uh, so problem number one is that this foundation is almost certainly wrong, okay? And minimally, and I think, I don't know which one of my institute colleagues to have blame for this wonderful, uh, or credit with this wonderful statement. <laughs> but we've known for many years from thought experiments, from all kinds of different uh, uh, lines of investigation, that at least the idea of space-time cannot really be fundamental and has to emerge from more fundamental ingredients. Uh, and this has to do with quantum mechanics and gravity together, most naively, associated with the physics at the Planck scale, some deeper sense it's really physics at all scales. But anyway, this is not a, a school and a discussion about that topic, but just to remind you, uh, this incredible structure of quantum field theory cannot be, just fundamentally cannot be the whole story, because at least one of its bedrock pillars, the idea of a space-time with local interactions inside it, isn't really there, can't really be there because of uh, the existence of both quantum mechanics and gravity. That's one question. But another problem that's more immediately relevant to the structure of the world around us and is more amenable to tests from experiment is a very simple question. Which is why is there a big universe with big things in it? You know, we have this whiz-bang theory that makes all these wonderful predictions for esoteric questions about the G minus two of the electron and the muon, and we predict these things at 12 decimal places and so on. Surely we have a good answer to the question, why is the universe big? Why is the world around us big? Uh, and why does this big universe around us have big things in it? And we don't have a good answer to that question. These are, this is just yet another, another way of talking about what the fine tuning problems are but I just want to take a moment to uh, cast the fine-tuning problems in the language of the attempt to answer this question, okay? So <clears throat> you would think, oh, it's not a big deal, you know, why is the, uh, I don't know, wh why is, um, why, are, why are the big things? Like, uh, let the, pick a random, pick a random object. Somehow every time I pick a random object, I pick an elephant. I guess uh, Nazi also used an elephant. Maybe we have something about elephants, but uh, yeah, take an elephant. Why is an elephant big? This doesn't sound like a deep question of theoretical physics. The elephants are big because they're made of lots of atoms, stupid. You know, they're, they're just big, okay? That's just life. Well, when you think about the question a little more deeply, though, we relate every single one of these questions about why there are, there's a large universe with large structures in it turn into the hierarchy problem and the cosmological constant problem <laughs> in the end, okay? So let's just take one line of uh, inquiry to this question of why elephants are big. Um, actually, before getting to elephants, 
let's just get to the whole universe, okay? Why is the universe big, right? So, so this is the real, this is the, really the biggest mystery of all, as uh, Nati also correctly emphasized. Uh, the universe is big. One feature of the universe being big is that it has very low curvature, which is why we can see, you know, all the way out. Uh, the, the, the curvature scales of the universe are much, much, much larger than the atomic scales or any other short, short, short distance scales that we talk about. But that's very mysterious because we would have expected the curvature scale of the universe to be set by the vacuum energy density, the cosmological constant, times G Newton. Okay? And no matter what the sign of the cosmological constant is, this, for all intents and purposes, makes a tiny universe. Okay? If the cosmological constant is negative, this is an incredibly curled up, you know, maybe it's an empty de Sitter space, but the curvature scale would be minuscule if the cosmological constant is large. If the cosmological constant is positive, it's, it's in principle infinite. You know, it's, it's a de Sitter expansion, an accelerating expansion. But any given observer has a horizon <laughs> around them, and the size of the horizon is tiny. Okay? So in every practical sense, these are minuscule, teeny tiny universes. Okay? Unless you make the cosmological constant very, very small. Now, to make the curvature radius of our universe, never mind the fact that we discovered that it is accelerating, but just uh, bef even before that, we knew that the size of this cosmological constant had to be bounded by around 10 to the minus 3 electron volt to the fourth, and this is around 1 over a millimeter to the fourth. By the way, just a very tiny quick aside. I know this is so elementary and embarrassing, I shouldn't even say it, and you guys are all super experts on this, but if you haven't done so, please become super familiar with what these units really mean, okay? <laughs> And, uh, and even though you're all super experts and know everything, single thing about it, if any of you want to explain it to me, my confusion in the discussion sessions, we can have a discussion about it, okay? Um, anyway, so, so you should, these kind of, going back and forth, that this should be like nothing in your head, okay? You should know 10 to the minus 3 electron volt is 1 over a millimeter like it's nothing, okay? That's what, that's the good of these uh, units. Okay, great. So, this, of course, is a, that's a humongous length scale. This is a teeny, tiny energy scale, and it's vastly smaller than any energy scales we have in particle physics. And every computation we can think of, every estimate we can think of for the vacuum energy gives us a number that's so many orders of magnitude bigger than, than that, it's not funny. Okay, so that's the, that's the first question. Why is the universe big is equivalent to the question, why is the cosmological constant small? And we don't have a good answer to that. Now, proceeding from there may seem like, may seem silly if, if you don't have a, a good understanding of that, but it's fine. You know, the, not every question has got to be answered simultaneously, so it could be that it makes sense to ask the other question even without having a good understanding of this one. So that's, that's perfectly fine. Uh, after all, you can't keep pointing to the cosmological constant and saying, oh, we, because we don't understand that, we don't understand anything. This would have stopped progress you know, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, you know, we've known about the cosmological constant problem or should have known about it for a very long time, and you can't just keep pointing to it and going, ah, right? You do whatever concrete, pragmatic thing you can, and you keep pushing. So let's say, okay, we don't understand that. So let's go to the other question then. Why is, why are there big things in the big universe? Why are elephants big? Let's get to that question of why elephants are big. Well, um, the bigness of elephants actually has something to do with the bigness of planet Earth to begin with. So let's back up and ask why is planet Earth big? Okay. Planet Earth is big. Actually, the size of planet Earth is determined by fundamental parameters. And this is a little exercise I want you to do. I'll give you the answer now, but it's an exercise I want you to do before we get to a uh, discussion sec session. Uh, something that you should know, uh, uh, again, made very much easier by working with those units, um, is, uh, let me just remind you, that the typical size of an atom is given by 1 over alpha, 1 over m electron. Okay? The size of the atoms are, are given by 1 over alpha, 1 over m electron. Um, so that's in terms of basic parameters. That means that the typical uh, n number density for atomic matter is 1 over r atomic Q. 
cubed. And the typical density for atomic matter is most of the matter is in protons, so it's m proton times n atomic. Okay? So this is just atomic physics in terms of fundamental parameters. Now, what determines the size of the Earth is something very simple. The Earth, or rocky planets in general, gets as big as they can until the gravitational pressure that wants to crush them is counterbalanced by the chemical pressure, breaking all the atomic bonds. Okay? So you have to, oh, and the typical atomic energies are alpha squared times m electron. Okay? So what you have to do is compare the gravitational pressure, which is the gravitational energy divided by the volume of the Earth, and you have to balance that against the atomic pressure. And when you do that, you get a formula for the radius of the Earth. It's a beautiful formula, if you'll work it out. You find that the radius of the Earth is equal to the square root of alpha over g newton and proton squared times the radius of the atom. Okay. See, the Earth is bigger than an atom by precisely the amount, exactly the amount, that electromagnetism is stronger than the gravitational force between atoms. Exactly that ratio is what sets the size of the Earth in units of the size of the atom. So the bigness of the Earth is a direct consequence of the weakness of gravity. You make gravity much stronger, you make it comparable to everything, foomp, everything shrinks down to the size of an atom. What about elephants? Well, this is a slightly more fun exercise. I will, oops, that's Earth. Our elephant is root alpha over g newton m proton squared to the power of two thirds times the size of the atom. And I'll leave you to think about where that two-thirds comes from. Okay. Well, I'll give you a little hint. Uh, for an elephant, for the Earth, it's okay to balance the pressure that wants to crush the whole Earth against, uh, against uh, the atomic pressure. But for an elephant, just liquefying the elephant is kind of way before that point you have a problem. Okay? In fact, you have a problem if you just break the bonds on a two-dimensional surface. Then the, the elephant would buckle and nothing could stand. Okay? So it's that difference between the fact that it's a two-dimensional and a three-dimensional problem that gets you that extra factor of two-thirds. And I, I, I invite you to put in the numbers. You get the right answer. Okay? You get the size of the Earth and you get the size of the elephant from these, uh, from these computations. So, you know, physics explains everything about the world around you, so you can explain everything. Again, as Nati said, up to irrelevant factors of order two, which matter if you want to make a career in, you know, basketball, uh, but don't matter for these kinds of estimates. But uh, what this shows you is that the existence of large things in the large universe is a direct consequence of the weakness of gravity. Not a, you know, some ancillary consequence, an absolutely direct consequence of the weakness of gravity. And now, of course, actually here, it's directly the mass of the proton. As, as Nati reminded you, we have a good understanding just in the standard model for why the proton is, is so light. It's exponentially lighter than some ultraviolet scale because of dimensional transmutation in QCD. But if we now took, if we now took the Higgs, uh, if we imagined that the Higgs mass squared was much, much more negative than it was, if we imagined that things were uh, more natural, uh, all the scales, all the, the, the electroweak scale would get dragged all the way up by the same kind of uh, fine tuning arguments we'll talk about more in a second. We get dragged up to the Planck scale. Um, and if we do nothing else, if we leave all the Yukawa couplings, everything the same, uh, the problem is that the quark and lepton masses become humongous compared to the QCD scale. The proton isn't, the mass of the proton wouldn't mostly come from uh, from, from dimensional transmutation, it mostly just come from humongous constituent masses of the quarks, everything would get dragged up. You know, the universe would look dramatically, dramatically different than it does. So, you know, these, uh, so the fine tuning problems are, are uh, of course, they're, 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 they're very, they're very severe, um, uh, but I'm just telling you here that they're also related to they're also related to uh, very basic, basic questions about 
uh, the structure of our world. Things you would like to have a good answer to. All right. So now I just want to spend my last few minutes amplifying on uh, what exactly the naturalness problem is. Um, not to explain it already very well, so I won't have to uh, uh, spend a lot of time on this, but, um, uh, but I also want to uh, de-emphasize a little bit the, the, the very technical aspect that seems to have which normally talked about associated with quadratic divergences. Of course, it's closely related to that, but let me say it in a slightly different way. So, so we see that it's very important, it's very important that uh, for this macroscopic world to exist, or at least have big things in it, that gravity be weak. And for gravity to be weak, it's important the elementary particle masses are much smaller than the Planck scale. In fact, they should be so much smaller than the Planck scale that you would like to think in some approximation they're massless. Okay, so let's imagine, does it make sense to talk about particles that are massless compared to the Planck scale? All right, let's think about the particles we know are exactly massless, like the photon. Okay? Is it mysterious that the photon is massless? Do we, does that cause us any, uh, do we have any problem thinking that the photon is massless? Um, now, normally, often at least, uh, you hear people say, no, it's perfectly fine for the photon to be massless because of gauge invariance. Because if, uh, if, uh, if you calculate radiative corrections because of gauge invariance, um, the photon is going to stay massless. That's actually completely backwards. Um, uh, the gauge invariance is a theoretical construct that we use, is very useful, very convenient, very helpful to use because the photon is massless. It otherwise has no content by itself whatsoever. So, it's, so you can't use this uh, theorist construct to explain something physical, like why the photon <laughs> is massless, why interactions don't change the mass of the photon. Now, the real reason the photon is massless is something we alluded to already. There is a discontinuous difference between the number of degrees of freedom of a massless and a massive spin one particle. Okay? So let's imagine in some approximation, let's say where the photon was free, okay? it's massless. There's two degrees of freedom sitting there. Now let's say you turn on a small interaction. You turn on the electric charge. You make it interact with electrons, okay? It cannot go from being massless to massive because there isn't that third degree of freedom sitting there. There's only two degrees of freedom. You cannot discontinuously change from two to three degrees of freedom by changing a continuous parameter, the strength of the interaction, okay? That's the reason why it's at least sensible uh, to have massless photons. Their existence is they're, they're, they're discontinuously separated from the massive case. If you have a massless photon in some approximation, any small perturbation you make to the system won't change the fact that the photon is massless, okay? That's true for spin one. It's true for the higher spins, for spin three halves and spin two. What about spin a half particles? Well, spin a half particles, uh, here what makes it reasonable for, uh, ha for having massless spin a half particles is the fact that the interactions that we see in nature are chiral. They distinguish between left and right. <laughs> if they didn't distinguish between left and right, we would still have a little bit of a puzzle along these lines. Uh, at least this explanation wouldn't immediately uh, explain it. That's because if, if, if all the interactions were parity symmetric, if we had a left-handed guy, we'd have to have a right-handed guy uh, as well. Uh, and so we'd have the same number of degrees of freedom for the massless and the massive spin a half particle. But while it's true that we have the same number of degrees of freedom in nature, what saves it is that the left and the right-handed guys are actually treated differently by the interaction. So they're really not in a multiple together, okay? You have the left-handed guys and they're different than the right-handed guys. So the same basic degree of freedom logic works. That's why it's okay for them to be massless. That's another way, this is a, a slightly more lowbrow way of saying the familiar statement. That, uh, that there's a chiral symmetry that can protect them, okay? So every particle with spin, spin a half and higher, there's a good reason why they can be massless compared to, uh, they can be massless and their masslessness is insensitive to any perturbation you might make to the underlying physics at shorter distances, okay? 
But the difficulty with the Higgs is exactly what makes it so special. Okay? It's exactly what makes it more exciting than a random garden variety particle that we've uh, discovered. The Higgs is the first elementary, by elementary I mean it looks elementary on the scales comparable to its mass, elementary spin zero particle than, that we've seen. And that's the difficulty. Because it spins zero, there is no degree of freedom difference between a massless and a massive spin zero particle. Okay? And that's why we don't have the same explanation for why the spin zero particle can be, uh, can be massless, uh, insensitive to any changes you make to ultraviolet physics that we have for everything else. Okay? It's exactly the thing that makes it so special, exactly the thing that makes it be able to do everything it does in the standard model. All the other things, all the, the fact that this one extra particle allows us to extrapolate things to all higher energies, all these fantastic things that it does, inexorably comes with this mystery that it's strange, that it's, uh, uh, it's very unusual. Uh, it doesn't seem insensitive to changing uh, uh, physics in the ultraviolet uh, to have this light Higgs. Now, uh, one of the ways of, there's many, many ways, of course we can just draw, we can draw the Feynman diagrams that show us the usual uh, low energy quadratic divergence. Um, we can uh, do things many ways. We can estimate the energy density in the vacuum um, as being just summing up uh, the half h bar omegas for every mode, for every particle mode that we know in nature. So uh, if we do that and look at the energy density, then we're integrating over all k's for every, every particle species of a half square root of k squared plus the mass squared for the bosons, and then a minus a half square root of k squared plus mass squared for the fermions. Okay, so that's an estimate of the energy density of the vacuum. And now, if we imagine changing the expectation value of the Higgs, these guys change. For example, for the W, this would be G times the Higgs squared. For the top quark, this would be lambda top times the Higgs squared. Okay? So we're just calculating the energy density of, of the vacuum, just summing the half h bar omega for all the modes. And this calculation, the leading two terms are our two famous fine-tuning problems, okay? The leading term coming at large k, where I can ignore all the m's, we just get d, d cubed k, k, that's the usual quartic divergence that Nati referred to, and that's the cosmological constant. So there's one piece that goes like lambda uv to the fourth, but there's a subleading piece that goes like lambda uv squared, and there's, of course, different pieces. There's maybe a g squared minus lambda t squared times Higgs squared plus dot, 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 okay? But we see that there's a one, one computation. The leading piece is a cosmological constant problem. The subleading piece gives us, just as we expected on general grounds, um, from our argument, uh, a contribution to the mass squared of the Higgs that's growing quadratically. Now, every time you have power divergent objects in any calculation in quantum field theory, they're not reliable, obviously. There's something which is dominated by what's going on in the ultraviolet. You cannot calculate this power divergent contribution. Um, all you can do is, it just tells you that if you have a theory like this, if you have a theory, uh, of the sort, it tells you that the mass squared of the Higgs is not something that you can calculate, given that low energy theory. It's just a parameter that you have to, uh, that you have to you know, fix by comparing to a data, okay? All of this uncertainty about what's going on in the UV just goes into changing what you mean by the M squared. This is very different, this is very different than logarithmic divergences. Logarithmic divergences are so important and they make field theorists salivate every time you see them. <laughs> because logarithmic divergences are not dominated by the ultraviolet. In fact, when you get a logarithmic divergence, the whole point is that it's coming from an integral like dk over k, and it's logarithmically divergent because it gets equal contributions from all scales, okay? So a logarithmic divergence is a property of the low energy theory. It's something that you can actually calculate and control and understand in the low energy theory. That's what the renormalization group is all about, okay? Logarithmic divergences, logarithms you get excited about. Power divergences are just crap. Power divergences are just telling you that's just something you can't calculate. 
and so it's just some parameter you have to take, ultimately, to match to experiment. This is why, from a strict, you know, pragmatic, practical point of view, there is no, uh, th th this hierarchy problem, this fine-tuning problem, is not a problem in the same way that the problem of quantum gravity is a problem, <laughs> okay? That really is a problem. That really is a problem. It has nothing to do with whether we think something is natural or unnatural or not. There are just questions, physical questions you can ask. We take two gravitons, you collide them at very high energies near the Planck scale. What happens? We don't know, <laughs> okay? It's not that, uh, that we can do the calculation some way, but we feel funny about it. We just don't know. The, the physics just breaks down. It has to be re replaced with something else, okay? Uh, these fine-tuning problems are not problems of that sort. And as, as Nutty uh, mentioned in his talk, this is why when you know, people first started talking about the 1970s, not everyone immediately said, oh, yes, we should all take this problem seriously. In fact, you know, I think half of the theorists of the time were like, I don't care. Just some parameter. I fit it to experiment. Who cares, right? So, uh, doesn't, does it stop me from doing a calculation? Nope. <laughs> Nothing. I just take it. I don't, I don't, all, all, this is all just ultraviolet mumbo jumbo, and, uh, and, 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 I, and I don't care. Okay? It's not the same kind of problem. It's very important to stress. Okay? So if it's not this pragmatic problem, why do we take it seriously? <laughs> okay? And the reason is that this is still telling us something. It's still telling us something because um, <coughs> uh, or let me say it in the sharpest way. This, in the standard model, the mass squared of the Higgs is not calculable. In the standard model, the mass squared of the Higgs is ultraviolet sensitive, okay? We could imagine lots of extensions of the standard model where the mass squared is calculable, is not ultraviolet sensitive anymore, and is calculable. That might just be something, even from a pragmatic point of view, that you might want to find, right? Maybe it would be nice to find a theory that could actually predict the mass of the Higgs, right? Make it calculable. In every single such, every single such ultraviolet, further ultraviolet uh, embellishment of the standard model that makes the Higgs mass calculable, in every single one, the hierarchy problem is present. <laughs> in every single one, it's very strange, if this new physics is coming in at scales much, much higher than we've been to, it is completely, it, it, there, calculably, you have to make bizarre cancellations between the parameters of that ultraviolet theory in order to make the Higgs mass small, okay? So in every UV picture that we can think of where the Higgs mass is calculable, we see the reflection of what we infer as the hierarchy problem purely from this bottom-up point of view, okay? And that, uh, so let me just give a few random examples. So one example of, an, of some ultraviolet physics, this cannot describe the real world for a whole variety of reasons, but, but uh, because of gravity and other things, but just the, the dumbest one, uh, which also makes contact with the, the origin of the Wilsonian picture, is to imagine the world is on a lattice, okay? Just put the world on a lattice that gives an ultraviolet cutoff is the scale of the lattice spacing, okay? Now you take that theory. Now you have a nice lattice Lagrangian, you write it down, right? And you ask in that theory, what do you have to do to make a light scalar? What would you have to do to make the Higgs light? Do you just put the m squared in the bare mass to zero? Nope. You put the m squared at the lattice spacing to zero, you get some crazy actual Higgs mass right near the lattice spacing, right? You have to finally adjust different pieces of the lattice action, you know, to your, the same, if the, if the lattice spacing was a Planck length, you'd have to adjust them to 32 decimal places in order to make the Higgs mass light enough, okay? So, in that, full theory where the Higgs mass is calculable, you have to do crazy adjustment of parameters in the ultraviolet in order for the Higgs to be light, okay? Or said another way, the lightness of the Higgs is very, very sensitive to what you do in the ultraviolet, okay? That's one example. Another example, which is closer in spirit to uh, things that uh, might actually be going on is related to one of the questions that was asked, is if the Higgs was a pseudo-Goldstone boson. Someone asked whether the Higgs could be like a pion, well, you, you're probably enough of an expert to know the answer to this, but those of you who haven't thought about this, uh, it's fun to think about a little bit. Actually, they, the, uh, the Higgs could really be a kaon, if you think about it. Um, uh, the Higgs and kaons are relatively closely related objects, okay? The Higgs might be a kind of a kaon of a bigger group, you know, just uh, some, uh, the kaons of some, the analog kaons of some, uh, uh, of some broken symmetry. Um, but, 
the Higgs is not a Goldstone boson. The Higgs is not a Goldstone boson because it has all these interactions, like the gauge couplings and the Yukawa couplings and all these things badly break the shift symmetries that would make it a Goldstone boson. Once again, in the low energy theory, you can ask, okay? We get the usual hierarchy problem, okay? But in this fuller theory, where it emerges from some ultraviolet complete theory that's maybe QCD-like at very, very high energies, you can just calculate in principle and you find, yes, the only way to get the Higgs light is to do this crazy conspiracy between couplings and the full theory. A final example uh, is uh, uh, imagine that the Higgs, let's forget about the fact that the Higgs is a doublet. Let, imagine the Higgs was in the adjoint representation of some gauge group, okay? We'd have the same problem. We have the adjoint representation, we'd have the gauge loops give you a big quadratic divergence, okay? Here's a really simple ultraviolet theory. Imagine a five-dimensional theory. Take a five-dimensional theory and imagine the five-dimensional theory is compactified on a circle. Then the fifth component of the gauge field, from the four-dimensional point of view, just looks like a scalar, right? Just looks like a scalar in the adjoint representation. So there you go. The, 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 the circle is radius r at very, very low energies. Uh, it just looks like a random scalar field. You don't know that it came from this uh, compactification. So you would draw the quadratically divergent diagrams. There it is, there it's getting big. But you know that really it's all calculable. The reason is that the second you go to energies above the scale where you see the fifth dimension, you see this is really a fifth component of a gauge field, okay? And, and, and as the gauge boson, it's not going to uh, pick up any big divergent mass. So this is another picture that makes the uh, mass of the scalar calculable. It's a very simple calculation that you can do. Maybe it's another thing that you could do before problem session if you wanted. It's a just, you could just set up the sum of a hatch H bar omega type calculation for that question. Um, and just calculate the scalar mass. And what you find is exactly the naive low energy expectation, okay? You take this low energy quadratic divergence and you just put lambda UV of order one over R, the, the one over the radius of the fifth circle. That gives you the right answer. That gives you the right answer that you actually get from this full theory where it's uh, calculable. So in every example that we know of where the Higgs mass becomes calculable, keeping the Higgs mass much, much lighter than the ultraviolet needs a huge fine tuning, okay? So that's, uh, that's one reason for taking uh, these naturalness arguments seriously, because, uh, because again, if, if we think that, uh, uh, if we think that we don't want crazy conspiracies like that to explain such a basic feature of our world, then we make a very qualitative prediction that we have to have a new physics showing up right around the corner. Now, another reason for taking it seriously, let me t tell you a couple more reasons for taking naturalness seriously. I'll just talk for five more minutes, okay? Um, uh, another reason, again, just related to the first one, is it explains things. It explains, as, as Wilson told us, it explains why it is when you walk out in nature, you have all sorts of different condensed matter systems, all sorts of, uh, all sorts of systems which are, are described by effective field theories at long distances. It explains why when you walk around, you don't just find willy-nilly everywhere you look light scalar fields. In fact, you never find light scalar fields, okay? When do we find light scalar fields? When you do something crazy to the system to either manually fine tune it to be close to a second order phase transition, or you, you, know, you take some hunk, of, uh, some, some hunk of metal and you apply pressure to it as you change the uh, pressure, at, even at zero temperature, you can get a zero temperature uh, phase transition. Uh, but again, you've got to bring the pressure to a very critical place, fine tune it in order to have the description look like a light scalar, okay? If naturalness was irrelevant, why don't we see like scalars willy-nilly all over the place? We don't, okay? So that's really, uh, that's really Wilson's picture. Of course, you could say our universe doesn't look like, maybe our universe is more exciting than a hunk of metal. I'm very sympathetic to this point of view, okay? I think the universe probably is much more interesting than a hunk of metal. But um, so we can ask, other than appeal to, uh, other than appeal to examples in condensed matter, have we seen situations? Have we seen the idea of naturalness come up before? Is this the first time? It's not the first time. Three times in the last century, uh, three times in the 20th century, we had naturalness issues come up. And every single time, the qualitative argument that new physics should come in at some relevant scale to solve the problem turned out to be correct. Let me just give you uh, one of them, probably many of you have seen this uh, argument, um, uh, but <clears throat> around 110 years ago, uh, 
people like Abraham and Lorenz and Poincaré were very disturbed by the fact that there seemed to be an infinite energy in the electric field around the electron. Yeah. Also, not to refer to this example uh, in relation to Weisskopf, but uh, I'm going to say something slightly different about it. So if you calculate the self-energy, the, the electric field goes like E squared over 4 pi R, right? Uh, sorry, the electric field goes like uh, E over 4 pi R squared. And so if you look at the, if you look at the uh, energy stored in the electric field, you get something like E squared over A. If you put it all in properly, right? Where A is some short distance cutoff that you put there, right? It's linearly divergent, and it goes like E squared over, over A. So this is the energy in the electric field. Now, what these guys said is that that's crazy, because if you, met, if you take the point-like picture of the electron seriously, you go to A goes to zero, this energy would be vastly bigger than the mc squared of the electron. So it's the same kind of fine-tuning problem again, right? Could it be? Well, I suppose it could be, because there could be the electromagnetic piece, there could be another piece, they could balance against each other very finely to get the final mass of the electron, but that seems wrong. You know, that seems, uh, even though it's not inconsistent, it seems wrong, and there should be some new physics by some scale to solve this problem. Now, which means that the actual contribution should not be much bigger than mc squared. It must be comparable to mc squared. And so we can use that to make a prediction for the scale at which some new physics should happen, right? You have to equate this to m electron c squared. So, um, so that gives you this thing called the classical radius of the electron, which is e squared over 4 pi m electron c squared. I'm keeping c here for a reason you'll see in a second. <laughs> All right, so this is called the classical radius of the electron. And what these guys did is say that, you know, something new needs to happen by here. And they even tried to make a model for what that new thing is. They said maybe the electron is as a size, you know, it's a shell, it's a shell that's that big. That was the technicolor of the early 1900s, okay? Because they were trying to make, I'm, I'm serious, they were trying to make a, a, a compositeness solve the problem. That, like Technicolor had tons of internal theoretical problems. It was very hard for to make any reasonable models like that. But even though their particular models were wrong, their basic logic was right. <laughs> the basic logic was that something new has to happen at or before that scale, right? Something new did happen. Not anything they expected. Something much more dramatic than they expected. There was quantum mechanics and relativity, particles and antiparticles, and this picture of the point-like electron was totally smoothed out and smeared out on a scale given by the Compton wavelength of the electrons and positrons, which is h bar over m electron c. So the actual scale where new physics came in, A actual, was h bar over m electron c. And now look at something wonderful. They were right. They were right that something new had to happen by then. In fact, something happened earlier. Let's look at the ratio of the actual length scale to the scale that they predicted. A actual over A classical is precisely 1 over alpha. So the new physics came in 137 times earlier than it had to. Okay? They were right. The basic logic was right. The basic logic of naturalness was right. And you see something more also important, that when it worked in the past, it worked big time. You know, no one was debating whether a 10% cancellation between the self-energy piece and the bare piece was okay or not, you know, way before it even became relevant, precisely because the theory has a weak coupling. When the theory of weak coupling, you can't have the correction be comparable in size to the leading piece. It has to be small compared to the leading piece. So you can't have a problem. I mean, you, you don't even get into a debate about whether a 10% tuning is too much. It, it, it just solved the problem flat out, completely done. So their basic logic was right. There's another example, almost identical to the hierarchy problem in the standard model, is the, the question of the mass splitting between the charged pion and the neutral pion. The charged and the neutral pions are different. The charged pion, you get to draw the hierarchy problem diagram, exactly the same diagram we draw in the standard model. Neutral pion, you can't. 
So if you took the attitude, oh, these quadratic derivatives, none of them make any sense, just forget about all of it, you'd miss an opportunity to make an interesting prediction, which is correct, which is that, no, some new physics has got to come in beneath some scale in order for the splitting not to be too big. You put in the numbers, the new physics has got to come in be beneath around 1.2 GeV in that case. And something does come in to solve the problem, it's known as the Rho meson, <laughs> and it's a 770 MeV. Again, it comes in earlier than it has to. Okay, so that's another time that it worked. KK bar mixing and the prediction of the charm is yet another example time when there was a quadratic sensitivity for a parameter that was, that was cured by the presence of a particle that came in at a scale, okay? And the scale was exactly the naive one. In fact, again, earlier than was naively predicted. So this idea of naturalness, while it is not, while the problem is not a direct physics problem in the, in the same sense as the problem of quantum gravity is a direct physics problem, it nonetheless seems to be an indication for the kind of new physics to look for and expect, which has an excellent track record, and also explains gross features of the world around us when it comes to condensed matter systems, okay? So that's why it's not, it was not crazy to expect that something like naturalness should be correct. And the reason for the relevance to the LHC can be seen very quickly not just that, not just that obviously we should see new particles at a TeV, but something slightly more specific is if we look at the correction to the Higgs mass, the biggest contribution of all comes from the top Yukawa coupling. And this gives us a correction that numerically is 0.3 times the UV cutoff squared. Now, this is three lambda top squared over a pi squared lambda UV squared and it's around 0.3 times lambda uv squared, okay? So, the point is that if we're going to imagine there's something that's making this calculable, that means in some imagined underlying theory, something should be canceling this piece at very high energies. And that three has to do with color. That three is n color, the fact that there's three colors running around. It's very hard to imagine very hard to imagine. You can do a very baroque things, but it's very hard to imagine that, uh, it's very hard to imagine that whatever that is, is also not gonna need to have a three in it and to have some couplings that are related to the top Yukawa coupling. And if the three that it has is for the same reason is that it's colored, that means that we have to have colored particles. We have to have some colored partner of the top quark to deal with this problem. We have to have a colored particle that comes in by some mass, and we can get an estimate. Now that we know that's 125, we can get an estimate of where this, uh, where this scale is. If this has got to be comparable to 125, that means that we have to have some colored particles lighter than 400 GeV. Okay? If we don't see colored particles lighter than 400 GeV, we have, it, we, have, we have problems. We, we have problems. Uh, uh, just this low energy contribution uh, starts becoming larger than anything that we can imagine. Okay, so, so that's, the, uh, that's uh, the prediction from the, uh, from the basic idea of naturalness is that there should be lots of new physics at the TeV scale some new physics at the TV scale, lots or not, I don't know, but some new physics at the TV scale to minimally solve that problem. Um, and it should be colored, that's important because the LHC is very good at making colored particles. We'll talk about that a little bit more tomorrow, okay? And this is very much within reach of, very, very much, indeed overdue within reach of what can be seen at the LHC, okay? So the analogous argument, for example, for the loop having to do with the self-coupling of the Higgs, that could be some weakly interacting particle up at two or three TeV, forget it at the LHC. Even the analog quadratic divergences coming from the W and the Z, that could be particles that weigh one or one TeV. Weakly interacting particles at one TeV is very difficult for the LHC to uh, talk about. Now, this argument is very important. It says there has to be light colored particles that we have to see. So let me leave it there. And uh, so that's the summary of the kind of standard uh, line of argument leading uh, us to believe that we should see lots of new physics at the LHC. Next time I will begin by finishing this discussion and going through some of the pros and cons of the idea of, of naturalness to sort of end up uh, 
the, um, the theory overview, and then we'll begin, uh, we'll transition to the second topic for a while of just talking about the basics of LHC collider physics. The third lecture, I'll come back in the end and um, tell you what I think is going on at the TV scale. Right.